Wendy Francis is National Director of Politics at the ACL. Wendy's back with us. Hi, Wendy. Welcome back to 2020. Always a real privilege to be on your show, Neil. Thank you very much for having me. Hey, Wendy, let's just cast some attention offshore as we get a update underway today. The world is reeling from the assassination of the former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Very few are reporting on the motivations of the gunman, and uh, multiple reports are saying that he held a grudge against a religious group. And I know that everyone listening will be wondering what religious group are they talking about? I wonder if you have any insights that you're able to offer. Yeah, it's the group that um, we I grew up knowing as the Moonies. And, uh, and this group still is very active. Uh, they certainly are active here in Australia as well. So it's a unification church, but I think many people will know them as the Moonies. And so what, what is, um, seems to have happened is that the uh, the young man who has assassinated the Prime Minister, and it's just so incredibly sad, um, was very angry uh, because his mother had given money to this church. Um, and, and can I say that it is, uh, it's, it's more of a cult, I think, um, is, is what I would describe it as. But his mother had given this money and he felt that this has very negatively affected his life. And so he wasn't able to get to, you know, like one of the heads of the churches. So he targeted, sadly, the Prime Minister. Mm. From what I understand, and listeners will be thinking, is this a Christian church? And I think we'd be very cautious because as a group that you might recognise and uh, without a doubt classify as a cult, mainstream Christians would recognise the group as a cult, the Unification Church, uh, where Moon as the Messiah presented himself as a form of Messiah Uh, to implant God's heart of love in his followers. Uh, This sort of thing, uh, for Christian listeners, uh, might be wondering about that, but uh, but they they certainly have been and have had a strange sort of reputation and uh, known for those sort of mass wedding ceremonies that you'll occasionally see on your television screen, Uh, but certainly certainly not something that as a mainstream Christian you'll be associating yourself with. No, no, that's right. Um, but it seems like this this young man was uh, a loner and very angry and very um, angry with life, and his anger was was targeting towards the the Moonies. But then the the Prime Minister had sent um, a, a message to the Moonies convention and had been supportive of them. And in, and in the role as Prime Minister, or even in our you know in our context. Many state members who are Christians will still send a message to a different organisation that they might not necessarily have a, an affiliation with, but they are representative of all their people. So the Prime Minister had sent this message, and so in the young man's mind, um, he had thought, well, I'm going to target him because he's obviously part of this big group that he felt so aggrieved at. It seems to be one of those organisations, and there are a number that do have some similar ways that they operate, uh, where parents, when their own uh, teenagers or young adult children get involved, they're concerned about uh, an indoctrination that happens uh, in these sorts of cult organisations. And I know that controversies have been around their fundraising techniques and uh, immigration issues and tax manipulation, those sorts of things can sometimes mark a group as uh, a cult. Uh, and the thought that you've got to somehow rather go undergo an, a, a, a uh, uh, what do you call it when you have to, uh, you know, uh, unlearn things to get out of cults yeah. like that. Yeah. And, and those sorts mm-hmm. of cults do exist. Everyone needs to be very, very cautious about those sorts of things. They really do, and I think that, you know, here in Australia as well, we need to be very careful if a church is, for instance, pressuring people to give large sums of money, um, uh, that would be a warning sign to me. Of course, as believers, we want to support God's work, and we should do that, not just by giving uh, a so-called tithe, but we should be freely uh, giving to God's work as he 
as you know, as he blesses us. But when you've got a group um, almost subscribing, you know, that you need to give this amount to be able to be blessed or whatever, then I think that's a huge warning um, of big, big red light for me. Of course, it is perhaps speculation about this group. Uh, so perhaps not even putting all eggs in one basket and saying this is the one, but this is what seems to be emerging. I'm not sure whether they have much of a presence in Australia, but uh, interesting connections there. Um, Wendy, let's move on. There's some big things that are happening around the nation. Uh, the Tasmania Conversion Therapy Legislation uh, described as radical and oppressive. Uh, what's your take on what's happening in Tasmania? This is really important, uh, Neil, because uh, we've been concerned for some time and we've talked a number of times about the Victorian conversion um, legislation and we've described it as being diabolical. Um, Tasmania is, is worse. So Tasmania is moving to a really a next level and in their conversion therapy, they're basically saying that um, even to say that humans are male or female and even to to say that the dominant attraction is between men and women is actually is actually fixing ourselves to to some sort of normative or um, an archetype sort of uh, normal that we're normally heterosexual or cisgender. And that these very beliefs are not only wrong, but that they are harmful. Um, and so they are forbidding any, any um, I guess, uh, evangelistic sort of way of saying that humans are male or female. And so um, the effect is that the facts, the very facts of biological sex, and even, I would say, even, you know, like statistical reality of overwhelming um, heterosexual attraction and conduct is now in their terms, a belief only, and it's actually a false belief and shouldn't be um, promulgated. So, so they are they are wanting to impact um, kitchen table conversations between mums and dads and kids, because uh, in the legislation they say, um, and this is a quote: "No domain or area of conduct should be excised from the definition of conversion practices." So they want to they want to reach in; their tentacles will reach right into mums and dads. And so mums and dads who even urge caution or abstinence uh, to gender or sexually, you know, if they're questioning sexually or wanting to experiment and mums and dads are are urging caution, um, that is potentially going to break the law and potentially be subject to penalties. If their children got upset and went to authorities, then that's potentially going to be subject to penalties. You know, the, the um, proposed ban will mean that... I'm sorry my voice is sounding a little bit croaky, isn't it? I've just gotten back from Canberra. I was at download <laughs> and I think okay. I've got a little bit of a funny throat. But the proposed ban is going to mean that clinicians who want to um, adopt a best practice, which is a wait and see, they will also be breaking the law if they do that. And so what will mean what that will mean is many of them won't want to even be part of this discussion. Pastors who counsel for um, for sexual continence or you know of you know of keeping yourself for marriage, um, even counselling against uh, transition of gender or or fulfilling desires that are outside of what God's plan is, they may be breaking the law. Um, we're going to see more and more 15-year-old children uh, taking drug therapy or, or mastectomies or other sort of invasive and ir- ever irreversible surgeries because um, they are not going to be able to get the proper psychological care that we would think they need. Well, you know, when you just come down to some of the basics that you've just described, Wendy Francis, the thought that medical professionals... Uh, there'll be there'll be particular ones who are specified to be able to deal in this area of gender dysphoria. In other words, uh, all your other highly trained uh, medical professionals, uh, they'll be left out of it or they'll be coerced into how they have to deal with this sort of thing. That just, uh, just uh, compounds uh, the seriousness of the concerns that parents ought to have. And parents, uh, they're going to be 
they won't be able to have a choice. They won't have a say. Uh, Criminalising the behaviour of parents, criminalising the behaviour of people who are involved in pastoral care in the church. Some will be saying, how did we get to a place where this can happen? Uh, It's unbelievable. Uh, And, you know, I think what you just said is really important, Neil, because what I'm saying sounds unbelievable. Um, but but if you just have a brief look through the bill, the legislation that they're wanting to put through, this is true. Um, and so the concern, the, the overwhelming concern is for Tasmanians, yes, but this will affect everybody throughout Australia because we know that as soon as one of these outrageous bills um, occurs in one state, other states try and take it on as well. It almost seems like it's a, it's a race to the bottom, to be honest. But... Yes, it sounds unbelievable. Trust me, this is exactly what the bill wants to promote. But we we are not certainly just allowing it to go through. We've got experts, we've got people who have detransitioned. All these people are flooding into Tasmania at the moment to speak to the members of parliament and say, this is, you just cannot do this, you cannot do this. Is there a timeline for what's going on in Tasmania, Wendy? And uh, for Tasmanian listeners in particular, but uh, others who'll be listening in thinking this is amazing, incredible what's going on there. Uh, What's happening so far as the the timing of this? Yeah, so the original timeline was very short um, because when the controversial piece of legislation is introduced, the most effective way to get it through is to do it as quickly as possible. But the amount of people who have been getting into members of parliament here, the amount of people that have been having um, appointments in the Tasmanian parliament has meant that the government has said, okay, this is obviously a big issue. We are going to take our time. So there is no set timeline at the moment that I'm aware of. And that is simply because of the response of people into the parliament. There is a petition, um, I could mention that a little bit later even, but uh, among things that people can do, but there is a petition, it's a um, it's a Tasmanian government petition, so it's not an ACL petition, uh, but there are more people saying, please do not go ahead with this um, legislation than the people who are saying, because there's two petitions. Um, the one that is saying, please get this done and to get it done quickly, is less signatures than the one saying, please don't do this. So that's really encouraging, but we need to stay in front on that. Okay, so look for those petitions. Uh, There's one of them, I think, on the Tasmanian Parliament website. And uh, for listeners, uh, I guess, uh, look at what you're signing before you sign it. Uh, Think deeply about those things. And uh, if you feel to sign it, then go for it. Uh, that one on the Correct. Tasmanian Parliament website, and there'll be some details on the ACL website as to what's happening in Tasmania. Hey, I haven't really caught your impressions, Wendy Francis. Uh, I've had a lot of discussions about Roe versus Wade and overturning mm. that from the Supreme Court in the United States. I haven't caught up mm. with you more specifically on the overturning there and the implications for here in Australia. What have your thoughts been since... Uh, things have, have happened uh, over these past couple of weeks? Look, I think, um, Neil, when, when, it, was, when it became um, news that Roe v. Wade, that there had been overturning of that, many of us fell to our knees and just praised God. Um, and in disbelief, to be honest, because I did not think I would see such a move in my lifetime. And so that sounds like I'm saying it's really hugely important and I I cannot I cannot overestimate how important I think it is. But on the other hand, um much of the media is just saying, you know, they're saying all these outrageous things. All that American has, the American um judges have done is re- is remove it from remove the decision about abortion from unelected judges. And they've put it back in the hands of elected people. They've put it back in the hands of everyday Americans because Americans now can vote for who represents them and the people who represent them are the ones who are making laws in their specific state. So it's very similar to what um, we, how we handle this situation, this issue in Australia. Very similar. So it's not, in one way, it's amazing. It's incredible and something that we really need to praise God for because it is, 
a very significant pro-life move. But on the other hand, it really is um, it, unremarkable in what it's done in that it's done what it should always have done and what people from both sides of this argument have known all along should be done. Um, but I do think that there are a couple of... It, what it has done is reignited some of the long-term discussions here in Australia of what we can do to inch back, to slowly regain um, the, the uh, desire for uh, honouring life. And two of those, I've been telling um, people, the two of those that I think that are achievable in, in certainly in my lifetime, uh, the removal of Medicare, Medicare funding for sex selection abortions. That is something that um, Australians find abhorrent, that we would, uh, be, we would have legalised, which we have done in most states of Australia, sex selection abortions. So remove the Medicare funding for that. And the other one is the Born Alive Bill that George Christensen brought up in the previous parliament and Matt Canavan has agreed to take forward into this parliament children who are born alive from an abortion and are viable babies, whether they are viable or not, to be honest, they should be given um, uh, certainly pain relief, but they should be given every, every medical assistance that another baby, a wanted baby, is given if they are born alive. Those two things, I think, are achievable um, in the short term. In the long term... We can only dream what we can do by by reintroducing the love of life to our nation. As you say, Wendy Francis, there is a long game to turn things around and an almost 50-year battle in the United States over that Roe versus Wade uh, law. Uh, let's just touch on one more issue before I have to let you go. Uh, the ACT and the Northern Territory uh, legislation to allow the territories to introduce euthanasia, something that the federal government's moved very quickly on to uh, to basically uh, offload that power to those territories to make their own uh, choices around euthanasia. What are your thoughts here? So I'm not as across the ACT as I am in the Northern Territory, but in the Northern Territory, this this really is um, this is not good, really not good. On the one hand, um, you know, the, the politicians are saying you've got to allow the territories to have the privilege of making our own decisions. But at the same time, particularly in the Northern Territory, there is no responsibility for, um, there's no fiscal responsibility. They, they would be bankrupt without the oversight of uh, federal parliament. And so I don't think that you can demand privileges um, without responsibility. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the Indigenous or First Nations people in the Northern Territory, again particularly because the Northern Territory has our largest um, population numbers of um, First Nations people, they are not being consulted about this. And I know, and we all know, that many Indigenous Australians, most Indigenous Australians, hold grave concerns about what we're calling voluntary assisted dying, but they just call assisted suicide. They are frightened by it. It is at odds with their culture. Um, they, they say very openly that it would weaken their cultural ties and, and it would actually lead to um, their people actually shying away from medical help when it's needed, particularly in remote regions, because they're saying things like, you know, why would you get on a plane going to Darwin for help knowing that doctors can kill you? You know, that they are, they are unhappy with this. And at a time when in Australia we just keep on being told rightly that we need to listen to our First Nations people and we need to hear their voice, in this issue, their voice is completely being ignored. And um, so that will be where our campaign will be focused. Wendy Francis, invaluable insights. Let me point listeners to the ACL website uh, where you can follow through on some of these issues, read articles, get resources and find out where you can, in fact, sign petitions and make a difference from wherever you might be today in Australia. ACL.org.au, the Australian Christian Lobby, ACL. Dot org dot au. Wendy Francis is the National Director of Politics at the Australian Christian Lobby. Wendy, thanks so much for the update today on 2020. Thank you again, Neil. I, I really appreciate you.